the Courageous Conversation this evening is in partnership with our Title IX office, which is also out of the Office of Equity, Diversity, and Special Programs. And we're partnering tonight to bring this event to you. Um, the Diversity Council, many of you have seen them around. We have some here that are in the audience as well. If they just want to stand up and wave their hands to you from all the different campuses are here as well. <laughs> And they help to bring these conversations to each campus. We look at events that affect the college community and things that mirror what's going on around our nation and our world. And we bring those conversations to you so that we can have an open and robust conversation. And so that was the impetus for Courageous Conversations. First on the program, we're going to have Mr. Darrell Miles. He is one of our Diversity Council members. And he is a professor at the Dale Mabry campus. He's going to come and bring a welcome on behalf of the Diversity Council. Please give him a hand as he comes. Thank you. Noted philosopher Soren Kierkegaard once said, to dare is to lose one's footing momentarily. To not dare is to lose oneself. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> I drove from Del Mabry. Anyway, <laughs> on behalf of our college president, Dr. Ken Atwater, I bring you greetings. And on behalf of the Diversity Council here at Hillsborough Community College, I'd like to welcome you to our final Courageous Conversations for this year. Today's theme, An Unexpected Journey, The Life of a Trans Woman, is sure to inspire, start a dialogue, and continue to educate all of us. Again, welcome to all of you, to our speakers, and let's continue to be courageous in all of our conversations because as Dr. Maya Angelou once articulated, one, one is necessarily born courageous, but one is born with potential. Without courage, we cannot practice any virtue with consistency. We can't be kind, true, merciful, generous, or honest. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Miles. Next on our program, we're going to have an introduction or overview of this evening. And Dr. Roy Kaplan, who is one of our consultants with the Diversity Council in the college, he's going to come and he's going to start the dialogue for us. Please welcome Dr. Kaplan as he comes. Uh, good evening. I'm uh, happy to see all of you here. Uh, and uh, I just sort of set the, uh, the guidelines for what we're going to do. We're going to have two distinguished speakers talk about uh, transgender issues in the United States, their personal stories. And then uh, we'll have an opportunity for a Q&A. Uh, and uh, you can ask uh, questions that you always want to ask, but you know, we're afraid to ask or whatever. Uh, but I will filter them. <laughs> They'll write them on the cards. And uh, uh, hopefully uh, we'll be able to get some interesting dialogue going here. So this is your evening. It's not for us, you know, for the people on the Diversity Council. It's for you. And that's why we present these courageous conversations. Um, I want to thank the Diversity Council uh, and Dr. Joan Holmes and Barbara Cockfield and, her, and their staff for helping to make this possible. Uh, this is, um, as they said, the last this year's series of courageous conversations. These are topics that command our attention and demand our response. And that's what we're all about tonight. This conversation, as I said, focuses on transgender issues. Uh, the National Center for Transgender Equality defines transgender people as, quote, individuals whose gender identity, expression, or behavior is different from those typically associated with their assigned sex at birth. Transgender people may identify as straight, gay, lesbian, or bisexual, or they may or may not undergo surgery to confirm their gender identity. Now, as we become more aware of the issue of transgender rights and safety, we should not lose sight of the fact that transgender people have the same rights that we all have, and they need to be treated with dignity and respect. Yet despite this notoriety and success of some transgender people, for example, Caitlyn Jenner and Laverne Cox, and I did happen to hear Laverne Cox speak um, this past summer at the University of Buffalo when there were 4,000 people, a little different audience, lined up uh, to ask her questions. 
Despite their notoriety, the National Coalition on Anti-Violence Programs found that there, this past year, there were over 22 murders of transgender people. 19 of them were black or Latina women. And that was only by half the year. So uh, the, the latest statistic, we were trying to go over this uh, before uh, we, we met here this evening. Uh, I, we don't have an accurate count at this point, but there were at least 25 that were murdered this past year. More than any previous year, since actually more than they have uh, ever recorded since they kept these, uh, th these data 10 years ago. There was a study conducted a few years ago by the National Center for Transgender Equality they interviewed over 60, about 6,500 people in every state, Virgin Islands, D.C., and Guam. And the findings were shocking. A tremendous amount of violence and discrimination perpetrated against transgender people, especially people, transgender people of color. African Americans received the worst treatment of any group. They found extreme poverty among the people, four times higher than the general population. And I'm not going to give you many of these statistics. One of our presenters is going to go over these and show a short video, so I'm not going to steal her thunder. But I want you to know that there's an alarming rate of violence perpetrated against transgender people. Harassment, 78% of the people reported being harassed. 35% said they were physically assaulted. And 12% reported sexual violence. Almost a sixth of them left school because of this kind of violence. And a really astounding thing is about a quarter of the people reported the violence came from police. So we have a long way to go. This I see is the next major front for developing human rights, respect, and responsibility in our society. One of the problems, you know, let me say this, as children, we're told that we can be anything we want to be when we grow up. But transgender people are often targeted for trying to be their authentic selves. One of the problems is that there's no federal protection for LGBTQ people. And they have to depend on local ordinances for safety. But today, there's a mounting campaign of fear and misinformation being conducted against the transgender community by religious bigots and right-wing, I have wing nuts, <laughs> <laughs> a lot of it over bathroom issues, which we were just speaking before. There are, there's no evidence that physical assaults, intimidation, violence occurs in, uh, in, in bathrooms where transgender people you, you know, make selections of the type of bathroom facility they want to use. Yet an ACLU, American Civil Liberties Union specialist and advocate for LGBTQ once noted that the more people understand what it means to be transgender, the more accepting they will be. And that's why we're here tonight. Won't you please join me in welcoming our guests and Dr. Robinson will now introduce them for you when we can begin our courageous conversation for this evening. Uh, good evening again, and I, I hope that uh, all of you got a chance to read uh, the bios um, that were listed on the website and so forth. Uh, but I've got a few more things I'd like to add and, and reiterate from that. But uh, again, welcome to the Ybor City Campus, and as uh, campus president, I'm very proud to have this event here this evening, uh, this opportunity to have this discussion and this educational opportunity uh, for our students, faculty, staff, and community partners. Um, we have two courageous individuals with us this evening who have dealt with and overcome uh, many great personal challenges to reach both personal and professional success. I'm going to introduce and talk about both of them uh, in sequence, and, and that way they can get to their presentation and, and I won't interrupt them. I know there'll be a flow, and I want to make sure that goes right. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, talk about Dr. Kathleen Robbins. Um, she said, call her Kathleen. Um, she was an Eagle Scout, an engineering graduate from the Air Force Academy, Vietnam War pilot, a former telecommunications company CEO, a Peace Corps volunteer, and a leader in economic development. She has led an effort 
led an effort in Haiti, and I understand it's going back soon, to provide access to information communication technologies to people who, who live on less than $2 per day. I mean, imagine not having your cell phone, okay? These are folks who can't communicate across a river for whatever reason, and they have to live on less than $2 a day. We pay more than that for some of our french fries, right? Um, Dr. Robbins was featured in a book titled uh, Coming Out in Faith, Voices of LGBTQ Unitarian Universalists. Her chapter was called Crossing the Rubicon. Uh, Dr. Robbins holds a Doctor of Ministry degree. Uh, next we have Ms. Gina Duncan, uh, who has served, is currently Equality Florida's Director of Transgender Inclusion. Ms. Duncan played football at East Carolina University as a scholarship recipient. Has over 30 years of banking experience, including serving as president of the Mortgage Bankers Association of Central Florida. She served two terms as president of the Metropolitan Business Association in Orlando, chaired Orlando's Coming Out Pride event, which annually, annually draws over 100,000 people to the Orlando area. And we just started our Tampa Pride back up just a couple of years ago, which will be this weekend, actually. Um, she has been featured on the cover of Florida Trend Magazine and is listed as one of the top 100 LGBT movers and shakers in Florida. That's Ms. Gina Duncan. Uh, Ms. Duncan and Dr. Robbins each have a great history, a great story, and many great things that they have done, not just for transgender people, but for those seeking housing, seeking to become entrepreneurs, seeking to connect with their loved ones, seeking equality and fair treatment, and seeking strength through their faith. Welcome. Good evening. Good evening. Um, those of you that are professors here, um, thank you for coming. Those of you that are students, even more so. Um, as Dr. Robbins said, Robinson said earlier, um, you know, this is going to be a question and answer. I hope your questions will be courageous. Um, what you always wanted to know, but we're afraid to ask. And now's your opportunity to do that. Um, Today I'd like to tell you a little bit about my journey, 22 years as an adult male and 25 years as a trans woman, and what I've learned along the way. And I say trans woman because um, there's one significant difference in how I was raised and, and my sisters. And so um, to keep me honest, one of my two sisters is sitting in the audience out here. so. If you need any fact checking or anything, you can. <laughs> she's she's your source of information. I'll be glad to disturb. Okay. <laughs> Quiet. Uh, I wanted to do a, a couple definitions. Um, talked earlier about Dr. Kaplan talked earlier about transgender, a definition of that, and I use that as an overarching term for a number of different. Uh, people, a number of different looks, a number of different ways of thinking. Transvestitism is the practice of dressing and acting in the style or manner traditionally associated with the opposite sex, a large majority of, of whom are heterosexual males. At one time I thought I was a transvestite. I didn't know any different, okay? A drag queen, we've seen a lot of drag queens. RuPaul is now famous. and. Um, but it's usually a homosexual male who dresses in drag and acts as an exaggerated female. Transsexual person is a person in a person's birth, uh, sex at birth differs with their psychological gender. A medical diagnosis of gender dysphoria can be made if a person expresses a desire to live and be accepted in the, as a member of the opposite gender. There's a number of theories why this happens, but no one really knows. What we do know is that it exists in virtually all cultures around the world. And for me, the why question was the hardest to get over. Once I said, it doesn't matter, it is, everything sort of fell into place. Transition. 
we're going to talk a little bit about transition and tonight and the difficulties of that. And it's the process of changing one's gender presentation permanently to accord with one sense of one's gender. And I apologize for these definitions, but I wanted to get them right so they came out of a medical dictionary. The idea of what it means to be a man or a woman or in between. For transsexual people, this process typically involves sex reassignment therapy, which may include hormone replacement and or sex reassignment surgery, which is now being called gender confirmation surgery. And living in their new sex that's different than their birth assigned sex. One area of clarification, and this hung me up for a long time, sexual orientation and gender identity are two different, totally different things. Um, the difference is that gender, gender identity is who I am, sexual orientation is who I love. So how did I get here? The short answer, to quote Anis Nin, and the day came when the wrist remained tight in the bud was more painful than the risk it took to blossom. It became too painful to be not be me and be my true self. When I was three, I knew I was different. When I was five, I knew I wanted to be a little, big, a little girl, but I also knew two things. Number one, it was impossible, and number two, it was shameful. So I focused on doing things that were expected of me. At nine, we moved from Seattle to Dallas. And we drove through Colorado Springs where the Air Force Academy was being built. I told my folks at that time that I was going to go there and did, which turned out to be a great place to hide from myself. You'll see with different stories, as you listen to trans stories, coming to grips with internalized transphobia is the hardest part of the journey of all. Um, at least it was for me. I thought I was the only one in the world, and remember, this was before the internet and Jerry Springer. So uh, the only role models I had were few and far between. I tried to bargain with God, take these feelings away and I'll be good, but that didn't help. And as I trans transversed the journey of adolescence, along the way I became an Eagle Scout lettered in football in uh, King High School right here in Tampa. Um, you a King grad? <laughs> Go Lions! My sister and brother-in-law are both grads of King High School also. Um, and remember, gender, and I had a wonderful girlfriend at the same time. And remember, gender, gender identity and sexual orientation are two different things. Sexual orientation is who I love, not who you are. Within three weeks of high school graduation in 1964, I found myself having my head shaved at the Air Force Academy. And within the next month, the Gulf of Tonkin incident happened, and the US became engulfed in the quagmire of Vietnam. During my time at the Academy, I discovered Christine Jorgensen's book, but I really couldn't relate to her journey either because she was attracted to men. I graduated from the academy, went to flight school, married six months after graduation, and much to my shame, did not tell my wife, Julie, about my desires until after we were married. Suddenly, when I did tell her, both of us were in the closet. We were stationed, I was stationed in the Philippines for two years where our son was born, and I commuted to war in Vietnam. Uh, that way, I didn't count against the congressional mandate on the limits of troops in Vietnam. At the same time, my feelings of gender dysphoria were growing, but there was no way I could act on them in the Air Force. And even to this day, there's no way a transgender person can act on it as they are in the military. But that is changing, and I have video that we'll see in a little bit just to show you them. I resigned from the Air Force after completing my obligation, earned an MBA, and three months, after the, three months after the fall of Saigon, I was out. My service had spanned the Vietnam War, but suddenly I was free of the military and could explore myself. 
good news, bad news. Okay, what do we do? You want to do it. You put yourself in a position where you couldn't do it. Suddenly you can do it. What do you do? Um, I overcame my fears in June 2000 and in 1980. We separated so I could transition. We had a great marriage except for one minor detail. Um, she wanted nothing to do with a lesbian relationship. In May 1980, just to complicate things, I got a call from Julie's high school where she taught chemistry. She had collapsed and was taken to the local hospital. Within an hour, the doctor called and said she needed to be transferred to St. Louis University Hospital. We lived 100 miles south of that, of St. Louis. The scan had shown a large mass on her brain. Ten days, the next 10 days were a blur of tests, two needle biopsies, both of which resulted in creating speech and movement problems, but no definitive diagnosis. Fortunately, wonderful friends were taking care of our son, Tim, who was nine at that time. After all the tests, the doctor said it appeared to be a very aggressive tumor. Surgery was out because of the location. There was no effective chemo, and radiation was the only effective treatment. Basically, go home and die. Needless to say, I gave up any thought of transitioning to take care of Tim and Julie. As Julie went through a brutal radiation regime, we sought out a second opinion, same results, and I explored alternative treatments. When the doctor couldn't provide any more suggestions, we decided to pursue one of the alternative treatments that I'd seen on 60 Minutes. With this treatment, Julie seemed to get better. And by 1987, remember the tumor was first diagnosed in 1980. Another CAT scan showed the tumor and, and was uh, and gone. Uh, once again, I began to transition. And in the fall of 1980, we separated so I could transition. And within six weeks of separation, I got another call. Julia had collapsed, the tumor was back. She passed away in 89, February of 89, and my son Tim graduated in June, in June of 89 and headed off to college. So now was my time to transition. Lesson number one, so what have I learned so far? Um, you have little control over what happens to you, but you have a lot of control over how you react to what happens to you. And while the emotional difficulty of coming out to friends and family is as hard for gay and lesbians as it is for transsexuals, the practical experience is uh, gay and lesbians can choose if, when, and where to speak. Transitioning for a trans person by its very nature means outing yourself to your friends and family. So that summer I told my parents, my two sisters, one of which is here, and my son, my brother-in-law, who we played football together. Um, he could also tell you stories. To my delight, no one disowned me, but it was the hardest thing I've ever done was to tell my son Tim about my journey. Following these disclosures, I had relationships with two women. I was still afraid and looking for a way out, but as the second one ended because of my desires, I knew it was more important to be me than to be in a relationship. In September 90, I filed for name and gender change in a court in Dallas. Who knew Texas in 1990 could be so liberal and there was no problem? I went to El Salvador to learn about the war that was going on down there, but not wa prior to watching a film called Witness to War, an Academy Award winning documentary about an American doctor in El Salvador. By the time I returned, the paperwork had done to change my documentation to get a job as Kathleen, a critical component in transitioning in life. You just can't go out. You got to go through the government hoops to um, make that happen. And I was incredibly fortunate because it went, there was no problem. Because I was more than a little paranoid, I wouldn't pass. People would recognize me as a trans. I set up an appointment with a headhunter in Houston. It was, if I was going to be laughed out of town, I wanted to be laughed out of Houston rather than Dallas. Um, 
the interview went fantastic. It was scheduled for a half an hour, and it went an hour and a half. I promise I won't take an hour and a half here. Um, and after the hour and a half interview, I went straight to the ladies' room. And as I came out of the stall, the interviewer came in and sort of glanced around and said, can I ask you a question? And of course, I knew exactly what the question was. And I go, of course, ask me anything, just like I did you. And she says, do you ever wear heels? You're striking. You should wear heels. Not exactly what I expected. While, while in El Salvador, I found many ex similarities from my, what I'd experienced in Vietnam, but from the ground this time, not from the air. I saw bombed out schools and hospitals, heard about free fire zones, and the same type of aircraft and helicopters were flying overhead. Immediately upon returning, I was asked to speak, and the comparison was very powerful because I could do it in first person. A week later, I had transitioned, and the same organizer asked me to speak again. I told her that things had changed a little bit. And she said, how? And, and I told her, and she said, fine, no problem. And I said, well, let's meet. Because realize you're very tentative. I was very, I was very afraid. And everything went smoothly. She said, do the presentation. I did the presentation. But I had lost much of the power as I spoke in the third person to camouflage my Vietnam experience. Um, lesson number two, you give up on your power when you aren't living your truth. Three months after transitioning, I found myself commuting to California as a consultant. On my resume, I'd only changed my name, removed my Air Force Academy, as women didn't graduate until 1980. I graduated in 68. And I was so very fortunate to find a job. While in California, I was introduced to Frank, an Air Force colonel who was moving from California, Texas, to Texas. It turns out that Frank was one of my classmates um, from 25 years before that. What are the odds? California, LA, 25 years, 600 grads. As I entered corporate America, having the same resume except for name and military experience, and oh yeah, I returned to my blonde hair color of my youth, um, I found in meetings and dealings with men that apparently my IQ had dropped by at least 20%. <laughs> Um, suddenly, my thoughts and suggestions were ignored only to resurface shortly from one of the guys and be supported by men and women around the table. Even at Cellular One, I found out that I was only being paid about 70% of what the man in Southern Illinois was being paid. Lesson number four, white privilege continues to be alive and well and affects all of us, men, women, white, black, gay, straight. The same mentality has been so oppressive to the people of Ferguson impacts us all in different ways. As you've heard, I've been incredibly fortunate. I didn't lose any of my family and was able to transition with little trauma or drama. I've been able to make a difference in my community, I hope, and support myself at least as well as in my own life and have one man friends. So why have, I become, why have I been so fortunate when, as Dr. Kaplan said, there's a lot of trans women, trans men that have not been so fortunate? The simple answer is my parents and my family. I have two younger sisters, Judy, who's here today. She's an engineering grad and a registered professional engineer. And my sister, Peggy, who's an insurance executive. Our mother, the top science student in her high school, wanted to be an MD, but when she learned in 1940, she had to choose between her dreams or having a family. Obviously, she chose family. Thank goodness for me and Judy, but I don't know about the world, and became a medical technologist, ultimately running a lab. In short, Judy and Peggy and I were raised without gender limits, with one notable exception. This is where Title IX comes in to a large extent. I was raised without limits by my parents when it came to my body. Um, I wasn't limited by fear. 
I and Judy, who was one year behind me at King, had the choice of being a cheerleader or a dancer. Um, while I had the choice of playing football, basketball, baseball, swimming, I did et cetera. I did two out of the many there, swimming and football. Fortunately, beginning in 1972, Title IX began to address this disparity. And today, King and HCC have a plethora of opportunities to participate in sports for women. Now I'd like to tell you a, a little story about love and war, about Logan and Layla from the New York Times. Said, gentlemen back there to start it, be about 12 minutes here. To ask you to think about two questions. Uh, why did Logan have such an easy time transitioning? And why did Layla have such a difficult time? What's the difference in that, those two things? And I, during the question and answer, I'd like to discuss that. And then the other thing I'd like you to notice is Layla and Logan both look, look very gender normal. Neither of them were gender queer, no were gender fluid. Both of them look like a standard man and a standard woman. What had been if they weren't so standard? How would they be treated then? Something to think about. The reality, and I've told you about my journey, you've seen what um, with Logan and Layla happened. I've been very fortunate, but Dr. Kaplan pointed out that lots of LGBT youth aren't so fortunate. They're disowned by their family, expelled from their church, bullied in school, and then generally pillared. And while the awareness of the problem is much higher than just a couple of years ago, thanks to people like Catelyn Jenner and Kristen Beck, stuff, there's still an alarming amount of people suffering and dying needlessly in the LGBT community. The thing that strikes me the most is 41% of transgender people and 62% of queer homeless youth have attempted suicide. Just crazy, crazy, crazy. So what can we do? In 2013 National School Climate Survey, the experience of LGBT youth was conducted by GLSEN. And professors, teachers set the set the standard. You're the ones that can set the, the pace and everything. Is bullying acceptable in your classroom? Are microaggressions acceptable in the classroom? That's the thing that has to be looked at on both at the high scale and, and the college level. And a hostile environment impacts, we know that impacts GPAs, we know that impacts children staying in school. All the things are there and one of the things that was talked to that Dr. Kaplan talked earlier about, a huge proportion of the deaths in 2015 were trans women of color. There's a real intersection between racism, poverty, and transphobia. And that's something that needs to be addressed. So I've chosen to speak up. Title IX now covers LGBT. We don't have a a national uh, protection, but Title IX is for students. Title IX is a protection for bullying, for hate crimes. So lesson number five, if I don't speak up now, even when it scares me to death, who will? It's time for us to begin to speak up. So here we are. The reality is I've had a wonderful life, the opportunity to travel to look at life in numerous ways, Air Force, Peace Corps, War Peace, male, female, got to keep things in balance, you know. Um, but the one thing I'd like to close with, for trans people, we have some responsibilities also to be honest to ourselves and others, to begin to really work at who we are and be honest about that to ourselves and others. Be professional. I was conducting a class at a UU church and there was a trans woman in the audience and she said she delights in 
talking in a feminist vo feminine voice to someone and then all of a sudden talking in a very deep voice and shocking people. I don't think that's productive or professional in any way, shape, or form. Empower those around you. Um, we've been, I as a transsexual woman, have been thinking about this since I was three years old. When I told my sister, she didn't have a clue. I had to give her time and space to adjust to that and give her the support, same support that I was wanting to get from her. I had to give her that same time and support to do that. And I be confident in yourself. If I feel somebody, I go into a store and somebody's looking at me like, I'll go up and talk to that person. I'll introduce myself. I'll go up and say, hi, my name's Kathleen. Um, Dr. Robinson, from Dr. Robinson down, support is critical. Trust in your leaders. Trust in the faculty that they're going to do the right thing and 99% of the time they will. Finally, plan your transition. It doesn't happen by accident. It really is a transition and learning from that as you go along. I'd like to close with a poem, one of my favorite poems by Mary Oliver. It's called The Journey. One day you finally knew you had to do and began. Though the voices around you kept shouting their bad advice, though the whole house began to tremble and you felt the old tug at your angles, ankles, mend my life, each voice cried, but you didn't stop. You knew what you had to do, though the wind pried with terrible stiff fingers at the very foundations though through their melancholy was terrible. It was already late enough in a wild night and the road full of fallen branches and stones. But little by little, as you left those voices behind, the stars began to burn through the sheets of clouds and there was a new voice which you slowly recognized as your own that kept you company as you strode deeper and deeper into the world Determined to do the only thing you could do. Determined to save the only life you could save your own. Thank you very much. I think I'm good. Good evening, everybody. I'm Gina Duncan. I am the Transgender Inclusion Director for Equality Florida, and I'm, I'm thrilled to be with you. Um, I have to say that... Um, over the last 18 months, I think I've spoken at every university or college in Florida, except for FSU. The Seminoles are still holding out on me, but I'm, well, put in a good word for me or something, but, but I'm very pleased to be with you. I thought I'd tell you a little bit about myself, but mainly I want to talk about what's going on in Florida in reference to the transgender movement and the transgender community. And there's a lot, as you might know. Ever since marriage equality has come to Florida, the crosshairs of discrimination have been firmly pivoted towards the transgender community. Like never before, we're seeing these hateful transgender predatory bathroom bills that are being introduced all over the state and all over the country, day after day. And um, I want to talk about that, but a little bit about me, who, you know, who doesn't like to talk about themselves. But um, it's very similar in, in Kathleen's story and the fact that, and what I found with transgender people who have transitioned later in life, not that we transition later in, <laughs> in life, but that it's very similar. Our paths are very similar. It's just a matter of timing in some respect. But I knew that I was different, if you will. I knew that I had gender dysphoria at a tender young age of five years old. We lived in Rockaway, New Jersey, and across the street from us lived this wonderful Irish Catholic family named the Moriartys. And the Moriartys had seven girls. Mr. Moriarty kept trying to have a boy, and he kept having a girl. I think he sat down, they said he sat down on the curb, and he had a breakdown when he had that seventh girl. But it was a Saturday morning, and I was walking out, and I remember it like it was yesterday, and I was flipping a football up in the air. And the Moriarty's door burst open, 
And my sisters and the Moriartys came flying out laden with boas and hats and jewelry and shoes. And they were going to have a dress up party. And my sister grabbed me by the arm as she went by and said, come on, we're going to do a dress up party. So, so for some reason I did. And when she finished putting that little flowered sheath on me and dabbed lipstick on me and polished my nails, I felt for the first time that I could breathe. And that's a feeling that has never left me. And it's a feeling that I needed more and more as life went on. But like many of us, life kind of got in the way. And I was raised in a large family. I have two brothers and two sisters and a very dynamic um, mom and dad who loved to travel. We lived in 11 states in Europe by the time I was 11. We settled in Merritt Island. Uh, my dad was a high-level NASA guy at the Cape. And uh, I grew up going to schools in Merritt Island. So I'm, I hail from Brevard County. But we were also a very athletic family. My dad was a all-world quarterback in college and my mom was a basketball player so we had a very athletic approach to life and I think that you know in we often talk about transgender people who try to offset this this dysphoria that they're dealing with and waking up every day not feeling comfortable in your skin knowing your gender identity does not align with who you are physically you often throw yourself into other ways and overcompensate, perhaps. And I was an all-state middle linebacker of an undefeated state championship football team at Merritt Island. I, I was an all-conference strong safety at East Carolina University playing under Pat Dye uh, up in East Carolina. And then afterwards, came back to Florida and got in banking. Uh, I had the good fortune of, of moving up in the ranks with Wells Fargo and uh, when I retired, from Wells Fargo. I was the regional manager overseeing 26 branches, um, 285 employees, a multi-million dollar budget. I basically had from Jacksonville to Miami, the east coast of Florida. I told Wells Fargo the same week that I was promoted to regional manager, I sat my manager down over a strong martini and I told him what I was going to do and talked to him about what it meant to be transgender. And he kind of took a sip of his martini and he said, well, I knew something was different about you. Your eyebrows were thinner and you've lost a lot of weight. He said, I just thought you were gay. <laughs> and I kind of laughed. And you know, I wanted to kind of go into, well, you should know that transgender people can be gay, straight, lesbian, but I didn't do that. But we did talk about an effective plan and exchanging ideas in reference to my transitioning. And part of it was thinking through the transition and having a partner in doing so. And I was very lucky. I shouldn't say I was lucky. I did a lot of research in reference to talking to Wells Fargo and in reference to researching Wells Fargo's diversity and inclusion program and knew that I would be supported by Wells Fargo. My boss said, I don't really know a lot about this, but I will find out. But know this, that we will be supporting you and you will be maintaining your job as regional manager at Wells Fargo. A couple of days later, I got a call from HR in San Francisco and the young lady said, well, Gina, you should know that, that you are the 17th person to transition on the job at Wells Fargo, so we got this. And, you know, I thought I was something special, but to Wells Fargo, you know, I was chopped liver. It's like, we, we do this every day, you know, so. But that put my mind at ease and the fact that my employer was on board. And my employer knew and was knowledgeable and aware about this. And much of the protocols and policies that I, that I have workshops with major employers um, across the country, are founded on those principles that came from Wells Fargo and then drawing from other major corporations that I've had the good fortune of, of speaking with and having workshops. My transition at Wells Fargo was very positive. My family was very supportive. My wife was not. Um, and, you know, and again, you know, if you leave here with nothing else, know that, know two things. Number one, that being transgender is not a choice. It's not a lifestyle. Because when you think about it, you know, my life as a man was amazing. 
I, you know, excelled in football. I excelled in politics. I was president of everything I've ever, you know, been a part of. I had this great job. I had this model wife. I had two kids, a boy and a girl. We had cars and houses in North Carolina and, and condos in Ponce Inlet. Everything you could imagine. Yet every day I woke up and despised the person looking back at me in the mirror. Until finally it came to a point where I could no longer live this lie. Even though I often think it wasn't necessarily a lie because it was a great experience for my kids and for, for our family at the time, but I knew that I was not being authentic with myself. And at some point in time, something had to give. And Kathleen said it certainly correctly in the fact that unfortunately, alarmingly within our transgender community, 41% of folks in our community attempt suicide at some point during their transgender journey. And it's something we, we're certainly working on and we hope that, that that decreases. But I knew at a certain point in time that I had to make a change and I had to be my true and authentic self or I had to commit suicide and you know do life 2.0. You know, a lot of us, I've talked to people that think, well, maybe, you know, when I come back next time, God will get it right. He'll have my, the right gender in the right body. And perhaps that's why some people, you know, take their lives. But uh, usually the fear is just extreme social isolation of not being accepted in society. But when I decided to transition, I did have a plan. And I did discuss it with my employer, and I had, I had support from family, friends, and my employer so that I could maintain my quality of life and I could move forward. In transitioning, I also found some things I didn't anticipate in the fact that when you transition, everyone with you transitions, your whole family transitions. My mom being the very insightful rock of a person that she is, she went out and bought Jennifer Boylan's book, She's Not There. And if you haven't read that, you should. But, so, and then she went around to each one of my brothers and sisters' homes and sat down with them and said, read this book. Because my wife and I had separated and everyone was wondering why the perfect family had blown up. How could this happen? The perfect family, two kids, wife model, everything's great. They thought, illegitimate kid on the side, I had had an affair, all kinds of things were swirling within our family. So my mother wanted to put a, you know, nip that in the bud and so she bought the book and took it to my brothers and sisters. And then I followed with visiting them and sitting down and discussing it with them. Some were more positive than others. I have a very conservative older brother who didn't embrace it, but Overall, they were supportive, and they didn't isolate me or ostracize me from the family, which was very important, and that often happens to a lot of transgender people. Work was fine. There were some bumps in reference to transitioning on the job at Wells Fargo, but for the most part, it was a very positive experience. It took some time. I had a situation where my assistant of seven years, and these are some of the things that you don't perhaps anticipate, but my assistant, my third day back at work was late for lunch. And Dawn was one of these people who was conscientious, always right there. And Dawn came back at around 3 o'clock. And Dawn isn't really her real name. But at 3 o'clock, Dawn came back. And I could hear her thumping down the hallway because apparently Dawn had been drinking at lunch. And Dawn doesn't drink. And Dawn came into my office and sat down and had a meltdown. And she said, I never had a chance to say goodbye to Greg. I love my boss, and now my boss is dead, and you're sitting there, and I never had a chance to say goodbye. And I'm looking out through these eyes at the same office, at the same assistant I'd worked with for years and years, yet she's looking back at someone she thinks she doesn't even know. And I think, if anything, that's one of the things that I didn't anticipate, the aspect of people feeling like you had died, and that all of that that perhaps they liked in you was still there, and perhaps even better, because now you could be your true and authentic self. 
and you no longer had to carry around this baggage that had been holding you back for so long. My daughter and I, soon after I had transitioned, we were cooking out. And we were on our deck, and I went to check on the steaks, and I heard my daughter start to cry. And I ran to her and held her, and I said, what's wrong? And she said, I miss my dad. And she went on to tell me that as she was always there for me through every surgery and every doctor's appointment, she would be there to, to support me or pick me up from, from when I needed to convalesce or whatever. But she said, every time you slipped further and further away from me as my dad, it cut a little bit more out of my heart. And all this time I was thinking, she's you know, she's right there with me, she's supporting me, it's great. But really it was tearing her apart inside. So I came to know that many of the things that I saw as positive were really people processing what it meant to love and support a transgender person. In the end, up through this point, it's been a fascinating experience. Um, it's been a fascinating living a life of male privilege and then losing that aspect of male privilege and absolutely true in the fact that soon after I had transitioned I went to a regional managers meeting and I had one of the best regions in the country I'm very proud to say we did well but I still remember and with that that usually I had you know cloud when we had regional managers meetings. You'd say something and everybody would go, yeah, that sounds good, yeah, I really like that. <laughs> Got like guys do, right? So, <laughs> regional managers meeting. We're there and same kind of situation. I thought I had some great idea and I spoke up and said, this is what I think they did and crickets. It's like <laughs> nothing. Ten minutes later, one of my colleagues said exactly the same thing. And sure enough, oh, that's a great idea. That's a great idea you do. So I thought, wow, again, feeling and experiencing actually what it means to be on both sides of that desk and experience male privilege and then losing that male privilege and seeing life uh, through the lens of being female. So briefly, that's my story. But what I would like to talk to you about if I'm not running too long and bring out the hook if I am. But I did want to catch you up somewhat in reference to what's going on in the transgender community in the area that Equality Florida is working so diligently on and with in reference to supporting trans inclusion. We launched our transgender inclusion initiative three years ago knowing, and I think it was very um, insightful of our leadership to see that the transgender community was going to be emerging. And for so long, you know, we were the silent T, you know, and, and there was a lot of people within the community that were trying to get legislation passed. And because there were few spokespeople from the transgender community, often legislation right up to ENDA, the Employment Non-Discrimination Act, failed because there weren't transgender people who felt safe enough or in safe spaces to be able to step up and support that. And I could see how there was a lot of frustration. S over the last two to three years, as I used to say that the transgender community was running to catch up, now it feels to me that society is somewhat running to catch up in understanding what it means to be transgender. In my group, we live by the adage of visibility leads to awareness, awareness leads to education, and education will lead to normalcy. So I'm always encouraging my transgender brothers and sisters and my brothers and, and my, my friends in our transgender umbrella of gender, gender non-conforming people and gender queer friends that visibility is the key to making progress. We see in intersectionality of institutions that we deal with right now in society, there's a great deal of movement going on. Let me first talk about employers. We have found that employers have been the keystone to progress. And you often see this in social media, but major employers get it. 
They understand that it's important to embrace diversity and have inclusive and diversity, diverse and welcoming platforms in their workplaces because that leads to economic development. They're able to recruit the best and the brightest. They're able to recruit the millennials who are looking at the Human Rights Campaign's Corporate Equality Index and seeing which companies are inclusive. So first of all, employers, I think this last week I did my 50th workshop for major employers across the country who wanted to make sure that their policies aligned with their practices. And what we found in many cases were that these companies were scoring 100% on the Corporate Equality Index until Gina Duncan knocked on the door and said, I want to transition on the job, and I know we have this great platform, and I know we score 100%, and I'd like to keep my job in transition. So bridging that gap between policy and actual putting that policy into practice is something that we've seen employers have needed help with, but they're willing to embrace it. And we're seeing that major employers also are a major leverage in working on public policy which has been a huge gain for us in pushing forward legislation and advocacy for the community. Secondly, school boards. We have a huge issue in reference to what's going on in our schools. And the reason for that is that more and more younger and younger trans kids are coming out at a younger age. And many school boards are balking at everything from bathroom usage to pronoun understanding to just supporting that transgender young person. And oddly enough, the parent is usually leading the charge because the parent is enlightened and informed and knows how that their child should be supported in schools, and yet schools are still requiring that they use the wrong restroom or they use the segregated bathrooms. And there's all kinds of horror stories. In Volusia County, for example, they went out and bought an $11,000 portalette for this one trans young man. And he was the only one that used that bathroom. In another example, there was a young man who was a trans man, trans young man, and good looking guy. 5'11", stout built, great goatee. He had been on hormones for about three years. Just a, a wonderful heart. He was being required to either use the girls' bathroom or use the faculty bathroom. So every time he went to use the bathroom, he would have to ask for a key. And they would roll their eyes and hand Ryan the key. Or Ryan could take his bushy face into the girls' room and use the women's restroom, the one that aligns with his biological sex at birth, which is totally wrong, and against the Department of Education's rulings. To complicate matters and, and to show how heinous this is with our young people is the football coach actually came to Ryan and asked Ryan to come out for football because he needed a fullback. Yet by golly, Ryan, use the girls' room when you go to the restroom. You can imagine what's going on in that young person's mind. Very, very debilitating. So we're seeing that school boards are a challenge, and we're seeing that even in Hillsborough County. We're seeing it in Sarasota County where there is some progress, there is education that needs to be done to move forward in that respect. Law enforcement, we've done a lot of educational aspects with law enforcement. I did a national webinar for the TSA this morning where we're educating TSA agents on how to better support transgender people who are going through security. Because right now, many, many transgender people are afraid to fly because they're afraid to go through security and the processes of that screening apparatus that the TSA continues to use. And lastly, let me talk to you about public policy. That is the biggest concern that we have as an advocacy organization and we should have as a, as a transgender community in the fact that we are being attacked on all fronts in reference to being transgender and they found the magic bullet in the Houston Human Rights Ordinance battle. And that was no men in the women's restroom. And it's a very hateful argument, but it's an argument that is based on no facts, and it is an argument that is totally flawed and is a very hurtful argument. And basically it goes something like this, that if you pass a fully inclusive human rights ordinance and you allow transgender women, such as me, 
to use the women's room, which you, when you think about it, their gender identity. When I walk into the restroom, my gender identity is what? Female. So if I go into the male's room, male restroom, as they say I should, unless I have my driver's license gender marker changed, think of the dysphoria that causes. But state after state is proposing these laws which, is re which are requiring that people use the restroom of their biological sex. They're passing laws that apply to schools where young people should only use bathrooms that align with their biological sex and not their gender identity. And they're basing this on, you know, religious reasons. They're basing these, these horrible laws on safety issues. And we even went back in Florida and Media Matters, a national think tank, went, went back and did a study and went back to all of the human rights ordinances that we've passed in Florida. And at this point, we've passed 34 human rights ordinances, fully inclusive, that protect all LGBT people, LGBT people from discrimination in the areas of housing, employment, or public accommodations. And they asked the lawmakers and they la asked law enforcement, have there been any increases in public safety issues? Have there been any increases in pedophilia? Has there, have there been any issues in reference to transgender people molesting young people in restrooms? And mainly young women in restrooms. And nada. National studies have also shown the same thing. So it's an argument that's based on hate speech and it's based on no facts whatsoever. And it's an argument that we continually run into when we're trying to push forward to pass human rights ordinances and also to pass a statewide non-discrimination law called the Florida Competitive Workforce Act. We keep pushing it further and further, but once again, it died in committee this year. But there's a lot going on. And it's because the transgender community is emerging from the Caitlyn Jenners to the, you know, Jennifer Mox to, to Laverne Cox, et cetera. And all of those people are making a difference because of that visibility. And let me, I will leave you with this last story because I am running a little bit long, but I like this story because it speaks to the fact that we can all be advocates if you want to be. And after all, you know, I see our commonality in the fact that we all simply want to be our authentic selves. And after all, who wouldn't want to be? You know, when you stop and think a bit about it, what day, do you remember what day you decided what gender you were going to be? I'll give you a moment. <laughs> right. Nobody decided what gender you were going to be. I didn't either. My gender just happened to not align with my biological designated sex at birth. 